So I really want to talk to you tonight about the misuse of words, I suppose, or rather the use of words and the way in which people manage to get journalists to do that. Um, I, I have to do this because every time I do turn on, and it's a privilege I only give myself in your country, uh, Fox or CNN, and I don't recommend it to any human being, um, nonetheless, I'm always impressed by the words. I took a note uh, in Beirut, where mercifully I cannot get Fox, but unfortunately I can get CNN, after the attempt by the Turkish activists to reach Gaza. And I tried to catch up on the latest semantics, and I got this within 36 hours. Islamic terror, Turkish terror, Hamas terror, Islamic jihad terror, Hezbollah terror, activist terror, war on terror, a familiar one, of course, from George W., Palestinian terror, Muslim terror, Iranian terror, Syrian terror, anti-Semitic terror. That's just 36 hours. Uh, but this is not really, I'm, I'm doing an injustice to, to suggest that this would be the Israeli point of view. Um, I think, to be fair to the Israelis and to the White House, both the previous one and your present incumbent, the lexicon goes like this. Terror, 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 well, I've got it written down here 60 times. That's about it. Um, we are in love with this word. We are seduced by it, fixated by it, attacked by it, assaulted by it, raped by it, and committed to it. It is love and sadism and death in one double vowel word. The opening of every television symphony, the prime time th theme song, the headline of every page, a punctuation mark in our journalism, a semicolon, a comma, our most powerful full stop. Terror, 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 terror. Each repetition justifies its predecessor. It is self-perpetuating, each terror giving birth to a new young terror, a baby terror in the arms of father terror, a terror attack followed by a terror alert, followed by the prison of terror in which we all live, or are supposed to, in fear, of course, of yet further terror. Terror, 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 terror. Most of all, it's about the terror of power and the power of terror. Power and terror have become totally interchangeable, and we journalists have let this happen. Our language has become not just a debased ally, but a full verbal partner in the language of governments and armies and generals and weapons. Remember the bunker buster and the scud buster and the target-rich environment in the Gulf War, part one of the Gulf War, Forget about weapons of mass destruction, too obviously silly. If you can't pronounce it, it might not exist. So we had WMD. Well, they didn't exist, but that was Gulf War Part Two, And this had a power of its own, a secret code, a genetic, perhaps, like DNA, WMD, for something which would reap, of course, terror, 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 terror. 45 minutes to terror. This was the Downing Street rubbish. Uh, you didn't need a news report when you had a movie produced by a Downing Street screen newcomer who knew all about Terror, terror, terror. Power and the media are not just about cozy relationships between journalists and political leaders, between editors and presidents. They're not just about the parasitic osmotic relationship between supposedly honorable reporters and the nexus of power that runs between White House, State Department, Pentagon, Foreign Office, Downing Street, Ministry of Defense, between America and Israel. In the Western context, power and the media is about words and the use of words. It's about semantics. It's about the employment of phrases and clauses and their origins. And it is about the misuse of history and about our ignorance of history. More and more today, we journalists have become prisoners of the language of power. Is this because we no longer care about linguistics? Is this because laptops correct our spelling? Alas, they correct my spelling into American spelling, and needless to say. Because they trim our grammar so that our sentences so often turn out to be identical to those of our rulers? Is this why newspaper editorials today often sound like political speeches? For two decades now, the US and the British and Israeli and Palestinian leaderships have used the words peace process to define the hopeless inadequate, dishonorable agreement that allowed the US and Israel to dominate whatever slivers of land would be given to an occupied people. 
I first queried this expression and its provenance at the time of Oslo. I think it was first used by Cyrus Vance. He would have been Secretary of State in 78 on a visit to Beirut, where I noted it in my notebook and I said, what is this? Question mark. See, a process proceeds. It moves forward. There is closure on the path. This is part of the language. It doesn't actually proceed anywhere. We're at the same stage we were in 78 or we were in 67 or 73. Nothing proceeds, but the fantasy world which is presented to you with our help is a peace process. And so we go on. Poor old Oslo, I always think, to be a city that had to be locked into a peace process. What did Oslo ever do to deserve this? It was the White House agreement that sealed this preposterous and dubious treaty in which refugees, borders, Israeli colonies, even timetables were to be delayed until they could no longer be negotiated. And if you mentioned it before the end, you were told you're going to upset the priest process. And how easily we forget the White House lawn. We remember the images, of course, upon which it was Clinton who quoted from the Quran and Arafat who chose to say, thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. And what do we call this nonsense afterwards? It was a moment of history, wasn't it? Was it so? Do you remember what Arafat said? The peace of the brave, he called it. But I don't remember any of us pointing out that the peace of the brave was used originally by General de Gaulle about the end of the Algerian war. The French lost the war in Algeria. We did not spot this extraordinary irony at the time. Same again today. We Western journalists, used yet again by our masters, have been reporting our jolly generals in Afghanistan as saying that their war can only be won with a hearts and minds campaign. It's there all the time. New York Times, USA Today, London Times, CNN. Nobody's saying, hang on, where did this phrase come from? It came from the Vietnam War, when we were busy bombing more people, most of them civilians. And what happened? We lost the Vietnam War. And some of the people inventing or reinventing hearts and minds in Afghanistan were junior officers in Vietnam. But we lost it. And we've still forgotten where that phrase comes from. Just look at the individual words which we have recently co-opted from the US military. When we Westerners find that our enemies, Al-Qaeda, for example, or the Taliban, have set off more bombs and staged more attacks than usual, we call it now a spike in violence or an uptick. That was my favorite one recently. Uptick and spike were first used by Brigadier General Kimmett in the Baghdad Green Zone in 2004. I had the misfortune to be present at this theatrical performance. It was a spike in violence. Now, spike's a very interesting word, because a spike goes up like that, and it comes down the other side. So you see the impression semantically, a spike is just something temporary. The real word is increase in violence. And if you, were to carry, if you use the word increase, it does not carry the guarantee or the condition of a decrease afterwards, which a spike does. Similarly, you see, we have a surge, like a massive wave of water carrying everything before it, like a tsunami. We have a surge in Iraq, and we're going to have another surge in, um, in, in Kabul or in, in Kandahar now. Do you notice that the early spring we were told we were about to have the Battle of Kandahar? And then the late spring we were about to have the Battle of Kandahar. And I read in a British paper last week we're about to have the Battle of Kandahar. I don't think there ever will be a battle of Kandahar. There was a battle called Marja, and Marja, it turned out, didn't really exist. But we won. <laughs> but look at the surge. You see, it's a tsunami, unstoppable, bound to win. It's not a surge. It's reinforcements. And you call for reinforcements when you're losing, not when you're about to win. These, this is the language which we use, not the words of serious journalism, the language of the generals. Meanwhile, of course, the peace process went on collapsing. Therefore, our leaders, or key players, as we have to call them, that's a little bit of anthropology to make you feel good, the key players tried to make it work again. The process, remember the words, had to be put back on track. It was a railway train, a toy train, you see. It kept coming off the line, we kept putting it back on because the Palestinians wouldn't negotiate or the Israelis were on building too many colonies, but it went back on track. So many times that after a while, we dropped it and had a road map. Do you remember the road map? And of course, you couldn't put that back on the track because it wasn't a train, it was presumably some kind of car or lorry. 
But now they've dropped roadmap again. Tony Blair was in charge, so you have to. And we're back having a peace process. And three months ago, for the first time since Oslo collapsed, CNN said the peace process was back on track. 